इंग्लैंड में थी Hello and welcome to the another edition of Business and Banking Dialogue. Today is a very special show for us. We have just celebrated the 72nd Republic Day and today we have a great opportunity to listen to some of the eminent personalities from the services who are who guard our border who are who guard us correct so So today, the ladies and gentlemen, we have three eminent personalities to discuss on 70 years as a republic, India's aspirations, lessons, and challenges as 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 we uh, as we move on. So live, we are as usual. We are live across EPS channels, including Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube. Ladies and gentlemen, when the Constitution. of india was adopted on november 26 1949 many considered it necessary to celebrate the document on a day associated with national pride which was january 26 since then we have been celebrating january 26 with a glory and pride for the last 72 71 years yesterday was the 76 72nd year however the 72nd republic day celebrated was not the same there was on one side glory and pride and on the other side shall i say dismay and shame i mean this is not what the freedom fighters and the people who guard our borders were looking forward to there was a problem so, i mean what were the problems are i mean those in a democratic setup needs to be sorted out anyway the colorful republic day, day parade culminated with a single rafal aircraft flying at a speed of 900 kilometers per hour what an incredible speed carrying out a vertical charlie as they call it didn't a heart swell with pride and admiration for the men who guard our borders i would say absolutely we are all thankful and grateful for the men who safeguard the country and us so let's begin our discussion today with the three personalities uh, first let me introduce you to briefly to brigadier sanjay agarwal sena medal and bar vet uh, you will see the slide in front of you so you can get a uh, yeah there you are former security advisor ministry of home affairs government of india advisor nhai advisor to the government of sessions he was president of the services selection board in the government of india and headed the assessment center and have assessed over 2500 candidates and personally interviewed for over 1400 candidates one on one oh. he is awarded by the president of india for gallantry he has been a mountaineer for mount everest mount kamet and gorichen and has led uh, a skiing uh, team uh, led a 3000 km cycling expedition brigadier agarwal has been a self development coach and trainer in soft skills motivation and a personality development he is a regular speaker on success in life leadership strategy management motivational issues in government industry fiki uh police and army training institution institutes institutions fdrc uh stafford university imt ghaziabad and to various corporates uh, uh welcome to the show, to the show sir brigadier sanjay agrawal thank you thank you 
Thank you, sir. Sir, you go ahead, introduce your other panel members and uh, you uh, take on the uh, discussions forward, sir. Thank you, Mr. Krishna Kumar. Thank you, EPS. And thank you, audience members. Many of you are loyalists and have always been attending the EPS webinars. We have with us Mr. G.K. Pille. Would you put on his introduction slide, please? He is an IAS officer of the Kerala Kada, and he was the Union Home Secretary from 2009 to 2011. He's an alumnus of IIT Madras. Earlier, he had been the Commerce Secretary, and when he was the Special Secretary there, he was the Chairman of the Board of Approvals for the SEZ, and also the Chief Negotiator for India at the WTO, a wealth of experience there. He was also the Secretary in the Department of Justice in the Ministry of Law and Justice. He has earlier worked in the Ministries of Defense, Surface Transport, and in Home, in the Home Ministry, he was the JS Joint Secretary Northeast and in the Commerce Ministry as well. He has also represented the state and central government on delegations to America, European Union, Argentina, Brazil, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Singapore, Japan, Sri Lanka, Philippines, Canada, Bangladesh, Myanmar, China, UK, Thailand, and Slovenia. one of the best people to speak to us and share his views on the topic at hand. Thank you very much, sir, for accepting to join us on this. We are indebted to you. Thank you, Mr. Pillesa. Coming now to General G.D. Bakshi. Many of you have seen him on television, often roaring like the lion in the jungle. He was commissioned just before the 1971 war and launched into it. He has commanded troops and served in all ranks in operationally volatile areas. Now that is something I say with honor because I have done so too. And it means a lot within professional circles. He has won numerous military and civilian awards, including for his poetry. He has oh. also been bestowed with the Chand Shekhar Azad Rashtriya Samman from the state government of Madhya Pradesh because he belongs to Jabalpur. He is a soldier scholar, holds a PhD in strategic studies, has been the equivalent of a professor, we call it senior directing staff at India's National Defense College. And he has authored 37 books on very diverse topics and about 300 papers in various prestigious research and military journals. He himself is also the editor of the prestigious Indian Military Review. You see him frequently on TV. You know that he is a nationalist to the core, a motivational speaker, and a very accomplished man in the spiritual journey of a human being. In addition, in 1978, he was my platoon commander and mentor at the Indian Military Academy. Some of you are aware of his Facebook fan following. With that, with the introductions, we will get on to the topic straight. And with the panel that we have, I will not say much in the beginning, except to lay out the structure, which fundamentally is that we would request Mr. Pillay, sir, to first speak and give his top thoughts on the topic at hand for about eight to 10 minutes. And thereafter, I would request General Bakshi to do the same, sir. Thereafter, we will take it as it comes. I would put in a few words, maybe. I could request both the eminent speakers to share additional thoughts and expand on based on the views of the other speaker. And then we will get on to the questions. So for the audience, it is requested that you please 
type in your questions. They will be taken on at least 20 minutes after now and they will come up to us. We may bunch them as usual. In an odd case, I will read them out, etc. So, sir, we are aware that, uh, Mr. Pillay, sir, India had aspirations. The Indian National Congress was the prime political party pre-independence. We had Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose's role within the Congress and thereafter due to various events. Incidentally, General Bakshi has written a book on Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose. We had him and the INA's role in getting us the independence and India had aspirations, the public and the leaders. The consolidation of India together from princely states into one country and Sardar Patel's role in that. What happened in Kashmir, Junagadh and Hyderabad, how Sardar Patel could control Junagadh and Hyderabad, but Kashmir, Mr. Nehru had kept with himself and what happened? So what has been the aspirations then and how have they evolved in the last 70 years? And then what have been the lessons we have learned, both our politicians and our policy makers? And based on that, my personal focus is forward looking, future looking, we are all generally aware of the challenges of the future. Of course, you will be able to nuance them very well. We are interested in the how best can India realistically meet the challenges of the future? Mr. Pillay, sir. Thank you, uh, Vidya uh, Sanjay Agarwal. Uh, hello to General Bakshi also and uh, Mr. Krishna Kumar. Thank you, sir. The topic is extremely wide, and I and uh, Vidya Sanjay Agarwal has given in one sense a panoramic view, but it is actually the Indian Constitution uh, which sets out in quite some detail the aspirations of the Indian people. One feature which many people don't realize is that in 1949, when the Constitution was framed, only 12% of India's population was literate. And yet, our founding fathers took the gamble of giving voting rights to all adult people in India, whether they are in the urban areas, in the rural areas, or the most remote tribal districts. And this, in one sense, this faith of the Founding Fathers has been proved to be justified. And we've had since then a series of uh, local general elections to parliament, to the state assemblies, and subsequently to the panchayats. The voting age has been reduced subsequently from 21 to 18. And we've had very successful conduct of elections for the last 72 years. I don't need to tell you, and I won't focus on where we have come from 1950 and where we are today. The wealth of vast difference. We are now the fifth largest economy, but yet the challenges before us, because we are still a developing country, we have the world's largest number of uh, poor. We have the world's largest number of malnutri malnutrition in, in the world today. And therefore, the challenges are extremely important. And we need to look at what are the lessons learned. There are some experiences of having gone in for massive industrialization of setting up the IITs, which in one sense has also paid dividends for us because part of the IT superpower that we are in one sense is because of all these institutions of higher learning that have come up. Yet at the same time, the fact that we still have hundreds of millions of people who are still illiterate, the fact that poverty is so huge, 
inequality is only increased means that the challenges for us are many and we have to now start looking at what aspects of our development policies did not work we have seen i think the lack of attention to basic primary education has led to the continuation of illiteracy among hundreds of millions of indians the lack of attention to adequate allocations and implementation of public health programs means that our malnutrition is high the cost of health care is expensive and we are suffering in that sense from uh, the lack of having given priority to those in the last few years we have had in india what i would say is a couple of shocks we've had uh, demonetization we've had uh, the introduction of gst across india and a lot of teething problems which still continue to this date we've had now the covid-19 the pandemic and we've seen in one sense as the covid-19 evolved over the last year all the problems that were there actually came to the fore a lot of good things happened i think uh, which really haven't got enough publicity is the fact that a tremendous amount of what i call as community and community participation in helping those not so privileged has actually taken place right across india okay. every level we've seen people setting up uh, food centers setting up uh, relief camps setting giving food and so on so we've learned that little bit we've also learned that the need that as we started working from home and as the lockdown continued we've had to innovate very drastically the innovation itself has had to be done very speedily because we had no time and yet we have seen that that innovation has taken place in a variety of ways and we've seen that many of rules and regulations which would otherwise have blocked those innovations took place because purely out of necessity and as things normalize what people come say that the rules and the regulations start coming back and start people start looking at small issues and say this can't be done for this reason and so on but today if i'm looking at the challenges and how to meet them we really have basically two three main challenges one is on need to set up infrastructure facilities roads rail the it infrastructure is absolutely imp imp important something which should have been done by 2017 the it the bharat net program is now expected to be completed by december 2022 this in, in effect means that by the end of december 22 every single village and panchayat in india would be connected through the net and that is an opportunity for both the it sector as well as all those who are in using uh, digit the digital platform uh, it's a tremendous opportunity because you are really looking at a market of almost 600 to 700 million people opening up so we would best you to take a minute and finish up sir yeah thank you so that is one aspect which is going to be extremely important the second i think i'm going to just leave it at this thought at this stage is that we've also seen that there is a limitations to what government can do and the role of the private sector and private industry in having an impact on what i would call as social issues and social sectors is becoming very very more important and the private sector will have to gear up to participate in these sectors so that the impact is made on the field i'll stop here over to you brigadier sanjay uh, thank you sir
that was an excellent overview on so many of the challenges ahead for us we now request the views of major general gagandeep bakshi sir over to you sir i think he's he's muted sir you may like so to unmute muted. yourself please general bakshi sir just tap on the screen and it will come the mute sign will come there is a microphone thank button you. thank you bottom. thank you thank you i am electronically challenged <laughs> so uh, thank you sanjay for inviting me and it is a privilege as i said to share the stage with one of india's legendary home secretary mr gk pillay we have shared the dais on very a uh, tv debate so let me without ado launch straight into the into the subject of the day and what i would like to stress on is the aspects of reflecting on the lessons learned in these 70 years right where you are going depends a lot on where you came from i'm going to focus first on the internal security affairs because large states like russia like china like india they tend to disintegrate not from external invasion but from internal stressor and that is why i want to take some time to focus not so much on the external environment which i shall come to in the q and a phase but on the basic nature of our state now the westphalian system of nation state is premised upon the monopoly of violence a nation state can come into being only if it disarms its population and only the armed forces of the union and the armed police forces retain the right to bear arms right that is the basis the monopoly of violence is the basis of a nation state westphalian nation state it came in with the treaty of westphalia 1648 but the indian state that succeeded the british empire crafted a unique narrative for itself they said we got our freedom because of non violence ahimsa and satyagraha therefore we were a unique state we were based on a uh, soft power not hard power in fact when general sir roy butcher went to meet the prime minister to ask for the expansion and modernization of the indian army uh, pandit nehru nehru ji told him that general i don't need an army the police is adequate i'm afraid it is this basic mindset that who is responsible for a lot of your problem firstly that narrative i am very sorry to say is historically incorrect you know we have a whole lot of histories which our ias colleagues have to pass their history based on the textbooks of you know bipin uh, chandra and uh, romila thapar and uh, sharma at all you see but the fact is when you talk of the history of your freedom struggle uh, you know it was it was only it was sorry uh, when you talk of the history of your freedom struggle it was premised it was stated that uh, we had won it by non violence but the fact of the matter is that all these leftist historians who have left behind our tombs have not they did not have access to the transfer of power archives that were declassified in london only in 1977 so you first so you first need to so you first need to you first need to correct your history you first need to base your historical analysis and narrative on fact i'm very sorry to state that a study of the transfer of power archives indicates that what really forced the british to leave was not non violent but it was the hard power applied by data ji subhash chandra bose and the indian national army i would refer to you to the actual archives please go through them the testimony of lord clement attlee the prime minister patrick lawrence the secretary of state for india field marshal field marshal wavell 
Field Marshal Lockinle, the Commander in Chief, the Viceroy, all the governors, etc. Now, because of this mindset based on ahimsa and non-violence, we violated one of the cardinal principles of what is a modern, uh, a hard power-based nation state. It is thanks to Sardar Patel that the Indian Army was not disbanded. It is thanks to Sardar Patel that the Indian Army was used in Kashmir right away and then in Hyderabad. But thereafter, once Patel was gone, it was the armed forces were starved of resources and we faced the disaster of 1962. Thereafter, we learned our lessons. We reverted to realism instead of idealism and the nation state then began. The nation state then began to rearm, expand its armed forces and by Pakistan tried to catch us in 65 before a military modernization and expansion could be completed and then we, we fought to a draw with the, had we just pushed a little bit more, perhaps we could have cracked Pakistan, but unfortunately the ceasefire was accepted prematurely. By 1971, the Indian nation state had fully armed itself with highly subsidized weapons from the Soviet Union. And the results were evident on the battlefield. In 1971, we broke Pakistan into two. In 13 days, in 13 days, we created a new nation state with the force of arms. We marched on an enemy capital. We had the largest mass surrender after the Second World War. 93,000 prisoners of war taken and a new nation state formed. So India was at the apogee of its hard power. But once again, we have found the decline because every time the external threat seemed to recede, we go into that mode, who needs the armed force? I'm afraid you will pay grievously. The UPA government, I'm sorry to state, for 10 years, neglected the rearmament and military built up. All our weapons of the 1970s decade, so cheaply given by the Soviet Union for the cost of bananas and tea, they had to be replaced by 1990. Most of them have still not been replaced. We are still flying, flying the outdated MiG-21. You know, after the Beaufort's crisis, we still, we still haven't replaced, we still haven't replaced the Beaufort's gun. It's uh, only now that the so more, please. has come. Yeah, just a minute more. So that's what I'm saying is your basal outlook to your security, especially external security, is a little flawed. Unless you correct this basal flaw, I'm afraid we will continue to run into crisis. We are facing a crisis now with the China, Pakistan combined, with Turkey thrown in, and Islamic terrorism on the rise. Islamic terrorism on the rise. I shall address, try and address those issues in the Q&A session. But what I have tried to outline today is the basic nature of the state in India and where we need to reflect where we need to change. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Illuminating as always, with many a nugget from history. There is a very interesting question from Harsh Prabhu, but I'm pending it for now. It will come up. It will come up. But before that, I want to request both first Mr. Pillay and later General Bakshi, if you want to add on anything based on what the other speaker has said in a minute or two, sir? Or would you prefer me to go on to the questions straight away? Question. Just one, one uh, aspect which, uh, and uh, to an extent in which I support General Bakshi, is that what we've failed, and we sort of in one sense continue to fail in, in terms of the uh, security is, we do not have even today a national security document for the government, for the country. Absolutely. And that uh, in spite of, uh, you know, I can blame the UPA that they did not accept it. But I think even the NDA of today, they have not also formally adopted a national security policy. Because only then will the national security as an instrument of state power, as an instrument of how everybody, all departments of the government will work, can actually come into effect on the ground. So, uh, excellent point raised, sir. I just want to quickly show one slide which has the problems 
the purpose of showing this slide is basically so that here and after in our questions and also our answers from both our eminent panelists we are able to focus on the answers so what i want to show is this meeting the challenges of the future we need to understand the scale of the challenge i do see a lot of comparisons with many other european countries even america is one third our population and then you factor in the diverse geography of india and the diverse demography of india so the scale of the challenge before the indian political leadership gets starkly clear the first challenge in my opinion is meeting the basic needs roti kapda makan bijli sadak pani and in the modern world internet poverty alleviation which uh, mr pillay has spoken about potable water education he has spoken about employment and remember the demography bulge soon we are going to from the boon it will become a bane because more and more people are entering working age so what is a dividend has to be handled properly before it becomes explosive material of disgruntled working age youth discrimination reservations and quotas that story everybody knows governance labor laws delays in dispensing justice law enforcement quality of policing and then when we come to future challenges maintenance of peace absence of war is not peace the definition of war itself is under change as far as i am concerned and i look forward to views from our distinguished panelists we are at war with china earlier it was a war with military traditionally then we had war with an all of government approach and today the culture is it's a all of people approach so the whole country versus the whole country and by that parameter which i established for myself i feel we are at war with china which presently is low on the violence but is intense on every other parameter there is a major challenge in reskilling our youth for the future workforce the government has done a great job on drdo with five new labs all directors under 35 years with full powers and financial powers job creation the socio economic inclusion of rural india societal challenges handling of the genie in the bottle which is now uncorked social media fake news and general bakshi has so eloquently spoken about the nation state being a hard nation state with a monopoly on violence i had thought of it in terms of internal control measures and balance between soft and hard a major challenge also which is not urgent in the minds of people who are surviving making it difficult whose lives are difficult but environment sustainable development goals air quality index health care climate and if you go external challenges i would say china is tops in perception management influence operations and selling its narrative imagine the wuhan virus even we are referring to it as the corona virus why it is the china virus wuhan virus but we are all calling it corona virus covid the strain which came out we are calling it the uk strain and the africa strain the original crime has not got its geography on it the where there is 100% precedence of it being called from the place of origin this is the power of china this is a challenge for us we have to build up our influence operations incidentally general bakshi was the indian army's first brigadier in charge of information operations in the whole of jammu and kashmir when this was thought of them security challenges then the territorial and the china issue the other challenges i think in security are the security of resources energy water information food rare earth elements and of course india has various success stories so with this i will now 
get back to the questions and Harsh Prabhu has asked a very good question. Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam, whom he considers one of the greatest statesmen post-independence, had stated somewhere in his book, Vision 2020, he thinks that Dr. Kalam dreams of a developed India, a first world country, the manifestation of which would be that India will be economically top three globally. Politically, ideally, a strong two-party democracy and also militarily strong as a deterrence in the form of an eye for an eye and a jaw for a jaw. And that India will, India and the world will consider very seriously and look at us with awe and respect. It has been a long time coming. How far away are we from that utopian day I dream of? This is a very good question from Mr. Harsh Prabhu and I seek opinions from both our speakers on this, sirs. General Bakshi, would you like to start? Uh, after you, sir. After you. Okay. okay. Uh, his vision is, is correct. And I think uh, it's something that we all need to uh, aspire to. The most important part of it is that unless you are economically strong, uh, you cannot be both powerfully powerful, both militarily and diplomatic. The strength, economic strength is actually... Uh, which is giving, giving you the basis for all your other strengths. The second aspect is, it's not just enough to be, we, we will still be, I think we are going to the fifth largest economy. We may become the fourth or the third largest in, in due course of time, purely out of sheer numbers. But if you have uh, a situation where there is such growing inequality that uh, the top 1% of India controls 60% of India's wealth, uh, you will find that uh, to an extent uh, you are uh, handicapped because you will not be able to mobilize the resources, the human resources that are available uh, to make yourself uh, politically and militarily uh, strong. General Bakshi, sir. Thank you. You know, I firstly totally concur with the statement that I think President Kalam was one of our greatest visionaries, greatest technocrats, and we are so glad that he occupied the highest office in the world. We are getting there. As Mr. Pillay very rightly pointed out, we are the fifth largest economy. PPP terms, we may be higher than fifth, but uh, I leave that aside. Uh, let me focus on the external dimension. You will be strong when you have autarky in weapon system. That was one of the prime, prime, you know, uh, goals of uh, President Abdul Kalam. Now, we had, the public, we had the public sector doing it for us, HAL and the ordnance factories, et al., et cetera, et cetera. And all that we got was, you know, putting together mechanosets, semi-knockdown kits, completely knockdown kits, in the name of self-reliance. And I'm afraid that has set us back by decades because it gave us an optical illusion of self-sufficiency in arms, whereas you don't need to just put kids together. You just don't need the know-how. You need the know-why. You need to be able to design. We lost our design abilities and design teams because we were just assembling kids and Pomeraka. And when we asked the HAL to put a machine gun, uh, a 23-millimeter cannon on the big, 20, big 21s, they could not do it. Then it is our Air Force workshops that added that. So now I think we need to get to visualize one of his primary visions and dreams, autarky in weapon systems. We need to involve the private sector in a major, major, major way. I'm afraid we have been cheated for far too long. It is now that the private sector has started getting involved. See Kalyani Forge. They built a medium 155 millimeter gun which outranges the American gun. That's got a range of 45. This has got a range of 48 kilometers. Indigenous. This is, the, the American gun can fire three rounds per minute. This can do five rounds per minute. It has an electrical self-propulsion system which is noiseless. So you, this is what you can do. The LCA is now a success story because the government has finally backed it and told these uh, those who are crazy for foreign, in inverted commas, to get on with it and use Indian. 
and make it work. Let the armed forces not set themselves up as critics, but get hands down and produce, hands down with the industry and produce the kind of weapon system that we need. Unless you have autarky weapon system, you cannot claim to be a world power. We have the second largest army. We have the fourth largest air force, the fifth largest navy. But technologically, we can't make ship engines. We can't make, you know, aircraft engines. We have a serious problem. We are good at airframes. We are now built the Arjun tank after 30 years of trial and effort. We are getting there. But unless you involve your private sector, you will not be able to actualize the dreams of President Abdul Kalam, one of our finest visionaries. So thank you for that, sir. At the moment, I do not have a question from the audience. I have asked them for questions. I would like Mr. Pillay's views on this point of state monopoly over violence. I would want our audience to come to know because I feel the majesty of law, which is the original concept. My grandfather was a district and sessions judge in 1938. The majesty of law has been much diluted, if not lost. Our police personnel, we hold them in ridicule, but they have a very difficult job. And as policy, I don't think we are helping our police in such ambiguous terms when I see yesterday's videos. So hard state versus soft state, majesty of law, and adequate use of the stick where required. Sir, your views, Mr. Pillay, first, and then General Bakshi, sir. See, whole uh, uh, essence of democracy is rule of law, rule by law. So it is extremely important for us to, in one sense, inculcate among the public at large, right from school onwards, the importance of adherence to laws and why those adherence to laws are important. Uh, you know, it's a simple matter of Look at the traffic laws. You know, we lose 150,000 people every year in road accidents. That's 150,000 people. And for all in for terrorism and so on, we lose 2,000 people every year. But we lose 150,000 people if, if get killed in road accidents, and Absolutely. nobody is bothered because it is so scattered across the country. You only hear of you know five people dying here, ten people dying there, two people being run over, and so on. So is importance of us to be a, a disciplined nation. And that discipline has to come right from young age. People have to be taught, you know, when we grew up, you know, there were civics classes, uh, moral science classes, all that has been given up in education today. And you need to have that respect for law right from childhood onwards. And this is very, this is very important. And I think that, if that is essential and laws which cannot in one sense, if you cannot implement a particular law, you should not have that law at all because then people get used to disrespecting the law and then you it's one, one after the other and then it goes uh, beyond. Thank you, sir. We have three questions. The first by Paresh Marathe for General Bakshi and thereafter by Vishwajit Laghate, which I will say the question now only. That is for Mr. Pillay. And then there is Pushpendra Khandelwal, who has raised his hand and he wants to ask his question. Pushpendra, your question should not be a thesis, please. So keep it crisp. First, Mr. Paresh Marathe's question for General Bakshi, why don't we have border with China just like other countries? Okay, I'm very glad you asked this question because you brought it to the elephant in the room, and that <laughs> is China, right? The simple fact of the matter is there is strong speculation and China is trying to stonewall the WHO investigation into the origins of the pandemic. The simple fact is there is a strong suspicion that this pandemic was made in the Wuhan Institute of Virology in China whether it was an accidental or a deliberate release remains to be seen. But there is enough in strategic Chinese literature to suggest that the Chinese had deliberately unleashed this as a biological warfare first strike 
as a biological warfare pearl harbor to weaken the United States, to weaken Europe, and then get tough with each and every neighbor on its periphery. It got tough with Japan over the Senkaku Island. It got tough with Taiwan. It is still flying bombers and this thing into their air identification zone. Just just two days back, eight Hong six bombers and you know another four fighter aircraft violated their uh, you know uh, air identification zone. Then it got tough in the South China Sea with uh, small nations like Indonesia, Vietnam, Malaysia, Philippines acting, throwing its weight around really. And in April, March, April last year, as you all know, it started that series of incursions in eastern Ladakh. You see, the thing is, here, what has the world done to punish this uh, very aggressive nation, which is needlessly throwing its weight about? flouting the rules of international rules and norms, the international law of the seas. It's flouting them with impunity and getting away. It has getting, it has gotten away with it clean. Who has been able to hold it to task? It is now creating a serious, serious situation for us. And let me give you a military analyst forecast. Come spring and come summer, you can be rest assured it will be a very hot spring very hot summer on the Chinese border. And with Pakistan fully in support, doing the Haina Act, should a conflict break out with India, Pakistan will definitely jump in like a Haina to bite us in our tails, right? We are in that dreaded two-front situation that we were always talking of. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. That is, that is right thing. So let me just add on this question, why do we not have a border like other countries have with China? Number one, China does not want it. They have in the South China Sea, the nine dash line, a vague, ambiguous 1,500 kilometers marked with nine dashes on a vague map. India has been pressing for exchange of maps annotated maps with China traditionally, and we have been rebuffed. The state of ambiguity on the border issue suits China for its policy of salami slicing, for its policy of taking advantage of weak governments, governments it can influence, and fifth columnists. And that is why it is in China's favor to keep it interpretational rather than putting it. This is the main difference between the LAC with China and the LOC with Pakistan. That is also not a border. But the line of control with Pakistan is marked on the map and the maps are signed by the director generals of military operations of both India and China, India and Pakistan and they are marked on ground to the satisfaction of both sides. That is the LOC. LOC. LAC is totally vague. Now I come to this question, sir, which is for this uh, question by Vishwajit Lagate for Mr. Pillay. When we talk about future challenges, where are we on reservations? There are reservations on caste. My question is, why should there be reservation? And how long should it be? I feel it's creating a division, or rather, it has already created divisions amongst society. Mr. Pillay, sir. Yeah, before I come to reservations, I'd just like to mention on the previous question, partly because yeah. uh, I've been a member of the China Study Group and been involved uh -huh. in the negotiations with China, uh, along with the Foreign Secretary uh, on the Chinese border. Uh, for the person who asked the question, the real problem is uh, the, the boundaries are what we call as lines drawn along the watershed, what we call the old McMahon line or otherwise. And therefore, there are differing interpretations of where the lines go. And second, because they were drawn at a time when neither India nor China uh, had any presence on the, at, in those borders, what really happened was that these were imaginary lines drawn and Indian forces are situated in many places uh, 
10, 15, 20, 30, 40 kilometers away from the border. And so we would patrol up to the border and come back. The Chinese were also equally, they were 30, 50, 100 kilometers behind. And they would patrol and come to their, what they imagined their line was. And so what has happened in the last 70 years is that both sides are moving up to the, what they feel is the border. And my own feeling is that you will finally have a border when finally you move up and they move down, if you want to put it that way. And when you come face to face, that's where you're going to have the border. Like you have in the Pakistan LOC and so on, is where the you're facing one BOP facing the other BOP and that becomes the line of actual control. That's what is going to happen. The, mis the mistake that we made in the early part of the Republic was that we didn't push, put enough resources and so on to push our forces right up to where our imaginary, what we imagine our line of the international boundary was. The only point is like in the middle sector, more or less the lines are almost 80 to 90 percent of what where the Chinese and the uh, Indian Army, both sides have a perception as well as the alignment on the ground is more or less agreed upon. That's the only place where the Chinese have exchanged maps and about 85 to 90 percent of the lines match. Other areas, neither have they exchanged maps or they've exchanged maps and taken them back. And therefore, we still have this, uh, what we call as we are moving forward and they are moving and it's you're in possession is nine tenths ownership. And therefore, if you start to possess the land, you, are, you, you have a greater right to that. That's what's happened. The other point, uh, the question which is asked on reservation, See, I think we, we must realize that especially for those who are from what I would call as the privileged class not entitled to reservation. Do you see what, what is the proportion of such people in government service, which is really looking at government service? You're not looking at the private sector, it's only in government service. It is far in excess of in terms of proportional to their population. And let us also face the fact that it is a fact, and you will find it across uh, many of your businesses and so on, you will find again, you will find that uh, people who are privileged, it, we, we can pick up a phone and people will call you on the phone and say, please give a job to somebody so and so, he's my relation, he's my friend and so on and so forth. And we are in debt, we are, happy to oblige him because we think we know him and you know the social context this doesn't happen to those who come from the what we call as the reserved category because they've never had the right chance for education because you kept them out they are economically poor therefore they again don't have all the facilities i'm i'm giving you just a simple example of one of my um, batchmates who got into the is he first generation, you want to call it, his, fa his father was a coconut tree climber. And he's come in first on reservation, that did his engineering, and then gets into the IAS. Where I think we, we are falling for, uh, short in the reservation or making the mistake in reservation is, once having given reservation, I'm giving you this similar example of if this officer who has now become an IAS officer, He's well. His children are now the sons, daughters of IAS officers. Three me layers. They must, it must end there. They can't get, because they've both, they've studied in the same, the children have studied in the same schools and so on. And you must allow the further people in the, in that category who are. Uh, please so continue, please sir. Take the benefit. Uh, okay. Thank you, sir. General Bakshi wanted to say something. Uh, with a greater respect to uh, Mr. Pillay, you know, I just want to go back a little bit into the history. I'm a history <laughs> student, so I, I just love getting back into history. One of the first fault lines identified by the British to break up this country was caste. You know, Sir John Risley held the first caste-based census in 1872. That was in the wake of the shock they got in 1857. First War of Independence. And then the collectorates and commissionerate were asked to collect data in their gazetteers, district gazetteers, on caste, on Varna, 
on jati, on gotra, etc., etc., much like you are doing for the Aadhaar card now. <clears throat> the first fault line they used was caste. And John Risley, who conducted the first caste-based census, said, as long as there is caste, there will be no India. For God's sake. So, uh, I am totally with the argument that we should look after our underprivileged, especially the scheduled caste and scheduled tribe. But now, if you make it a tag of identity and to put the economic imperative onto it so that people fight and squabble, our entire elections are based on caste. How long will you be stuck to this caste? My humble plea is that we should make, you know, even Ambedkar had said, that these would be time bound. He had thought of 50 years. This is 70 years plus, and at this rate, it looks like for the next thousand years we will have the same uh, caste uh, based, uh, you know, merit uh, being crushed and caste being put up. And I, I, I would love to see the lower castes, the especially the scheduled caste and scheduled tribes coming up. But my greatest worry is that this will keep changing caste fault lines. My Thank you, sir. We have, a, we have six more questions already in. Economics-based, economic criteria-based. Whosoever is poor gets it, even as Mr. Pillay said. Thank you, sir. We have six more questions pending. We will take them first in, first out, FIFO. There is an audio question. We request uh, audio permission for Mr. Pushpendra Khandelwal, please. And the request for audio question is, please keep it very crisp. Yes, ask your question. Sir, so, Jai Hind. Jai Hind, Jai. please ask. And mention uh, your question is addressed to a particular panelist or it is to open. Sir, it is open question. First of all, I would like to thank EPS for organizing this webinar on the next day of our Republic Day. Sir, my question on new challenges for country is first your views on immature and irresponsible statements by the politicians first. Second, whether we are using our democracy in right spirit and we are, uh, whether we are abide with our duties and only talking about our rights. This is my question, sir. Thank you. Sir? I think, I'll just be brief. I think uh, we are a young democracy. We are still what we call only 70, 75 years of, since independence. Uh, other countries have been, in, in, you know, much longer. Uh, and look at, you know, literacy and other uh, uh, developing country stages. Don't give, uh, don't be too critical. I think this is a phase through which we have to go through. Uh, more education, more literacy, uh, more institutions coming up. People have to develop this, uh, what we call as spirit of nationhood has to be cultivated right from childhood. And I think that is, it's very important. You know, we all grew up with Boy Scouts and then we had an NCC and the, it is important for all those institutions to come up because that they develop that spirit of nationhood. And I think that is very important for us. The next verbal question, Mr. Mani, please raise your question. And then I'll come to the written questions. Yeah, good evening. Thanks a lot to the panelists. My name is Mani Mamal and I also come from uh, a background of a Sainik school. I studied my life in Sainik school. So thanks to see basically just you know both army veterans out here. So my question is, I think it's you know very simple. <clears throat> I had seven years schooling in a Sainik school, and during that period, uh, we never had any difference of economic indicators or or caste based, religion based indicators. And when we passed out of the school, half the guys went to military, half the guys uh, stepped out, who didn't basically qualify for the NDA and SSB. So I was one of the an unfortunate one to be on the other side, on the unfortunate side. So I didn't go to the military, I just came into the civil side. So, but my thing is, when those things are available, those systems are all available, we understand that. That is not being implemented basically just you know, across the other fulcrums of the society or other wings of democracy that we have. That's the problem, one. Second is, 
to be cynical about our own country is another big problem in this country um uh, mr based, mani may i request you to shoot your question please my my question to the panelists is why these sort of things which is already known to us are not getting implemented across the other fulcrums of the society that's what thank you sir ordama it's god here okay then chen bakshi is mute i think uh, uh, see i think uh, these is systems a... are going to take time for us you know we we say that why is this not happening and i i i give you the classic example of why is there not a national security policy for the for india but everybody except that this is the common national security policy uh, both the upa and the nda are shy of actually adopting the national security policy because if you adopt a national security policy then everybody gets bound by the discipline of that i'll give you an example we were fighting left wing extremism in you no know, central india and i found that you don't have roads in those areas you don't have mobile towers for communication etc and our forces uh, the police and the central police forces required roads and communication yeah. the cabinet note for constructing roads the cabinet note for setting up mobile towers was actually initiated by the ministry of home affairs because they think we think that this is an internal security problem we is not looking at this a national problem and therefore the ministry of road transport has got many other things to do they have got so many other roads to build in other areas than these disturbed areas a low priority because uh, contractors will have problems and so on and so forth the tenders are not being picked up etc mobile towers the same thing if you build a mobile tower somebody might blow it up so they don't that's not the priority but it's a priority it's a national priority and national priority must be binding on ministry of telecommunications as well as the ministry of road transport it's not only it's not ministry of home affairs responsibility alone or ministry of defenses responsibility national security is the responsibility of the entire government of india not just of these two ministries thank you yes. sir Jan i'm Bakshi coming on to the verbal the written questions now i have seven of them prashant bhatia asks sir don't you think our greatest challenge in 10 years would be that all our neighbors would be sold slash bought by china how do you address this scenario general bakshi <laughs> a lot of them already are you have seen what is happening in nepal the way china is muscling in there you seen what has happened in myanmar and we had to fight back very hard and we been able to to an extent win away the uh, myanmar uh you seen what happened in uh, the maldives and thank god for the recent elections when the people of maldives threw out the pro china uh, parties in power which had been entrenched there uh, china has a policy of string of pearl as per that they are trying to encircle you they are trying to bear up down upon you from all sides one of the greatest cat's paw of china is a state called pakistan uh china has done more to arm pakistan than any other country has done for another state uh, the entire nuclear weapon program of pakistan has got a made in china tag they have given them designs they have given them rockets when the americans put sanctions they put them in touch with north korea they have gotten the nodong and taipodong designs from there 80% of the chinese uh, of the pakistani tanks gun jet fighters are all from china they are now building that uh, china pakistan economic corridor which is a major strategic threat to you so the fact of the matter is that uh, china is already trying to throttle you from all sides from every which way possible i'm very glad that we've started doing tit for tat if china can play the pakistan card we can play the tibet card we can play the taiwan card and we are giving it tit for tat we are Now going to the South China Sea nations, we have what you need in the future is a quad kind of an alliance or a quasi alliance based upon India, Japan, Vietnam, Korea. You know these are and possibly Taiwan. And at the global level, the United States, India, France, Australia, and Japan will, would make a pentagon of sorts, if not a quad. 
that's already in the works what remains to be seen is what will joe biden do will there be a bipartisan consensus in american policy and the hard line against china of the trump era will continue or otherwise but india has to be strong enough to stand on its own america or no america we should try and build alliances we should try and build supportive strategic partners but if not we should have the strength to go alone we so now i will add jump to what you are saying general bakshi sir there is another question which is exactly what you are talking about this is from mr rajendra dikshit my question is for sir major general gd bakshi will quad have any impact on china quad has already had an impact on china it's got china seriously worried and concerned but china is now playing its cards quite right it is uh, you know i think it has been able to influence the united states election and the and the day that joe biden took charge they put sanctions on all the ministers all the secretaries of state and secretary of defense etc of the trump administration so the fact is the quad has got china worried whether the quad holds a lot will depend upon what joe biden does or does not do i think there will be a bipartisan consensus in united states policy there always has been on security affairs and to that extent quad will continue if it does not we must make a strong alliance with japan we must try and make a strong alliance with vietnam south korea taiwan we must counter and circle china we must give tit for tat uh, thank you sir let me add here and then i'll show a slide one slide on china on the quad issue i hope our audience is aware that there is a thought today quad what we say is actually a security dialogue and therefore the thought to metamorphose this into a nato like alliance with military muscle this thought is there and towards that end if you see india has conducted naval exercises with various stakeholder countries including australia now having said that and seen the amount of interest our audience has this was my summary slide when i was speaking on the issue of china so i will flash it for 30 second and not speak because there may not be time so here is that uh slide Next on one. china taming the dragon i have been speaking multiple occasions including for eps how do we tame the dragon just read through it will save time and we'll proceed to the next question okay paucity of time we are well over the hour mark but eps and mr krishna kumar have graciously said that the amount of interest that we have generated in our audience so you may please continue so next question straight away let me uh, thank you mr vishwajit lagate for your various comments i will not be reading them out for paucity of time uh Mr Ritesh Singh asks are we likely to be a permanent member of the United Nations Security Council in the coming decade and what would that mean for our borders any of the panelists sir can i yeah sure thank you sir uh you know the present structure of the united nations is dictated by the post war lineup of the victors the allied powers that were there and you know china was included but then china went communist the seat was offered to india then you know are you aware that india voluntarily wanted to give it up to china and thereafter we have been requesting the united nations to give us that seat in the security council and so far we don't have a permanent seat we only have we only have this thing my answer is very simple maximize your comprehensive national power maximize your comprehensive national power so that the world is forced to uh, to you know acquiesce to agree to the realities of the ground 
change the reality on the ground change your power your economic power index your military power index your national power index and you will find the world will have to acknowledge china uh, you know nobody has any doubts on china's power and influence so you maximize your comprehensive national power and we'll be there i totally agree with uh, mr pille that we need a national security doctrine we need a national security strategy we need a whole of the government approach it can't be left to the ministry of roads to build the infrastructure alone it's a national priority it needs to be done we haven't built roads so far in the himalayas we haven't completed them thank god this government stepped on the gas and uh, got the roads going otherwise we would have had serious problems in eastern ladakh thank you sir the next question is about the role of social media in revolutions so i am thinking of this is asked by mr vishwajit lagate so i am thinking of right from arab spring downwards i am also thinking of the threats and terror infused by the isis by putting in public domain their public beheadings and of course i am th- looking at what is happening in india what happened when there was a scare of migrants triggered and compounded by the social media it's like a genie vishwajit lagate which has been let out of the bottle technologically and nobody has the means to control it so the answer therefore one view is that these tech companies are too big for their own good and for the world's good the counter view is that freedom of expression demands that they be allowed to grow capitalism demands that what are the views of our uh, panelists mr pillay sir yeah i agree with you that in one sense uh, it it is a genie that's uh, out of the bottle one doesn't know how to put it i think uh, if big tech these companies who own or dominate social media do not uh what shall i say self regulate or develop what i would call as develop algorithms which will itself take care of the what we call as the disruptive or hate media and so on you will find that governments will come bound to come in and break up these high tech companies there will be pin election and i think once uh, a ceo of a high tech company is uh, you know is arrested and put behind bars the company will straight away uh, start complying with this because you can't allow this to happen and uh, uh, there are certain what we call as basic rules of uh, governance of democracy of uh, the way you you can function and uh, this is very essential that uh, the, the laws will be made and if uh, I, i have my own feeling is that the laws will come sooner than later will come possibly in the next 2 to 3 years and you can see that like twitter banning a sitting president's account absolutely it just shows that they are now subject to their own pressure of their constituents thank you sir now there are a few more questions i will have to request permission if you can carry on but i will take an audio question this is by one mr krishna tripathi Mr. Tripathi, please ask your question. Uh, my question is for uh, Mr. Pillai, sir. This is Krishnan Tripathi from ETV Bharat. I remember meeting you when you were in India. Your question, please, Mr. Tripathi. Question. Yes, fair enough, sir. Uh, um, sir, my question is: How do you see the handling of tractor rally? Uh, do you uh, think that it is wrong to? allow the tractor rally on republic day uh, at the first place because there was every potential of mischief so how do you see this thing sir uh, mr pillay sir mr pillay sir mr pillay sir mr pillay sir the in full I, disclosure mr tripathi is from etv bharat please continue sir as far as i am concerned i i think it is a mistake to have allowed the tractor rally at all because if people want to make a a, a demonstration or a peaceful this thing you should not you should have anticipated that the tractor is going to be used as a weapon and you should never have been allowed because once you allow huge crowds to collect 50000 or more and you just cannot control them there is no way you can control them it is much better to have said look you stay at your protest sites we will not allow it on republic day on any under any circumstances whatsoever thank you sir can i just, 
something there because it is so current. Yes, sir, please. You know, uh, there is a feeling that yesterday was a pre-planned, very pre-planned affair. Uh, you know, they had agreed that there would be no violence. They started at 12, they started at 8. They have used the tractors almost like tanks. So they, they broke the protocol on the roads and routes, they were told. They got onto the iconic red port. They, you know, they very rudely flung aside an Indian flag. They created an Indian Capitol Hill style, you know, movement on the day of your Republic Day. I totally agree with the Mr. Pillar. It should not have been allowed. And then it was, it has been allowed. What they were hoping for was uh, an overreaction by the police. You become mute. Which would have, you know, uh, created a... Precipitated the situation. And exacerbated the situation. But now we need to go very pinpoint, very focused, identify the miscreants, deal with them ruthlessly. Please deploy tire busters. Please destroy, uh, please deploy drones to photograph all these mischief makers and deal with them as harshly as possible. Don't go berserk in your response. Be very focused, very controlled. Be nice Thank to you, the, sir. Be nasty now, to Mr. The Mr. Krishna Kumar himself has a question for us. Should India recognize Taiwan or will it antagonize China and force a war? So it is like this. It's a good question for the audience. We have what is called an escalatory ladder. And with the number of additional vectors, it is now called an escalation matrix. So there are tolerance thresholds and there are escalatory steps. So in my personal view, and we will have the opinion of General Bakshi and Mr. Pillay on this issue, the point is, why couldn't we call Mr. Dalai Lama his Holiness the Dalai Lama as the chief guest when Boris Johnson refused. So Tibet, Taiwan, Uyghur Muslims. Why can't we know name Shantipath as Colonel Santosh Babu Road where the Chinese embassy is located? There are certain issues which the government would be aware of and they would take those as actions up the escalatory ladder at a time they feel it is warranted. There is the second issue of crossing red lines which China did in Galwan. We do not want to cross red lines first. However, once they have done what they did, the one China policy, in my opinion, our having agreed to it earlier and our having had the two agreements in the last 20 years, the last being 2005-06, they stand abrogated. When India decides to encash on this is a decision at the highest level. So certainly the option is there, but you can stop short of recognizing Taiwan. You can open a consulate there and they can open a consulate. Before a consulate, you can. we already have certain trade ag agreements. So this is all in the shades of gray India is working on it. Further comments from Mr. Pillay and General Bakshi, sir. No, I think I generally agree with you. I think uh, it's an, always an option open for India. Thank you, sir. General Bakshi, sir. Uh, my, uh, I, I, I totally go along with what you have said. I just like to add the following. You see, there is an asymmetry in sensitivity to red light. You know, we are always kowtowing to the Chinese red light. Don't they respect us? They bloody well will have to respect India's, you know, red line. The simple fact is the Peace and Tranquility Accord said no weapons will be used two kilometers either side of the line of actual controls. They have used lethal force in Galwan to the extent of killing one colonel and 19 OR, other ranks, other boys of ours. We can't take it like down. We can't go back to business as usual. And yet I find that there is that kind of a compulsion to adhere to uh, China's red lines to fight on their terms. Why should you cede the initiative to China? Every red line, why should it be crossed by China first and by us as a kind of a follow-up? If China is intent upon pushing you, killing your citizens, your soldiers, why should we stop using firearms? Why Thank are you, we sir. expending crores of rupees on buying weapons every year? We have the best. Why can't we use them? 
they are violating our borders. So I, I, I think I very strongly suggest that we now, this asymmetry of red line should be a thing of the past. After they have drawn blood, this can't continue like a joke. Thank you, sir. Now there is a question pertaining to the army and therefore I want not General Bakshi, but Mr. Pillay to share his views with the audience. Prabhakar Kaza asks, in a democracy, government proportions scarce resources judicially for the military. You cannot starve people to beef up security. Any comments? I have, but I'm withholding them. Since I'm a Fauji, I'll have Mr. Pillay's views for the audience first. No, I think uh, there is no question of starving civilians or starving the military. Uh, the defense, you, you need the defense forces for, a, for particular purposes because if you, if you cannot defend your own borders, then you come under pressure from people who are inimical to you on your border. And therefore, you are actually, the civilians on our side of the border uh, expect the government of India to protect them because that is the primary uh, objective of any government. And as uh, uh, General Bakshi said, the monopoly of violence, you have to have, the army is your first monopoly of violence then the armed police forces and so on. So uh, I don't think so. I think every government takes it takes a view. Sometimes uh, you may you may say it's not given enough priority for uh, the defense forces. Uh, that is that in a, in a democracy, all sorts of combinations are weighed. There's political, there's elections to be fought. There are, uh, you know, uh, so everything has its consequences. So. I think, uh, by and large, uh, they've done. Uh, uh, the governments have done well. My personal feeling, also having worked in the Ministry of Defence, is that I think, in the initial years and possibly till such time as you come to a particular level, more allocation to the defence forces is essential. And uh, you can always raise money in different ways to make sure that there is adequate uh, money available for uh, arming the defence forces. Thank you, sir. General Bakshi, your views. Look, uh, the uh, debate of guns versus butter has been perennial in every single democracy. And the people, therefore, tend to think that the democracy is a weaker form of government. Look at the results of the Second World War. When democracies are challenged, they respond. And then they respond much better than autocratic regime, fascists, communists, etc. We, we have had this problem. And that is why I emphasize this problem at the outset of your basic national narrative. Thank if you, you try and impose a pacific narrative which is unrealistic, you have to get real. We got our reality check in 1962, and thereafter the governments have responded very well. We've had a small, we have had a problem of sorts that our 1990, our economy came to the verge of collapse. 1990 was the time when most of the Russian Soviet era weapon system, big 21s, 23, 27, T54, T55 tanks, 130 millimeter gun, were all due for a change. And because our economy was close to a collapse, we could not allocate the, the amount of resources required. Now it was felt that by about uh, the start of this century, our economy had gained enough traction to equip ourselves. We lost a crucial decade, 2000 to 2010 and 2013. But I'm afraid there has been a serious gap, serious gap created. We are now trying to make up for it with emergency purchases. And like Mr. Pillar said, I totally go with him. There is no dearth of resources. You just have to make up your mind. Unfortunately, a mindset comes. India will never be attacked. With nuclear weapons, no war will take place. I'm afraid when you talk in those definitive terms, then you can be surprised. As you were in 62, when you felt no country in the world can attack a peaceful, non-violent, insatmic state like India. You got a shock. Don't Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Vishal Sharma has a question. Dear sir, please guide us on two, three major things that we should or should not do in order to support our country in the economic war against China as we all want to do our part as responsible citizens of India. So this is something, Vishal, that is answered on this slide. If you have a look on this slide, you will be able to see this 
what we should and should not do is there. Is the slide covered with the dialogue box or you can see the full slide? Is it partially covered? Mr. Krishnan Kumar, can you see the left part of the slide? Yes, sir. I think it's okay. perfect. No, no, no problems. Everything is okay. okay. So the point yeah. I'm making is what we should or should not do. Brigadier Sanjay Sarwal, can I just make a point? Uh, Certainly, purely sir. From a, from a trade and from a business point of view. Sir. See, the fact of the matter is that to a, to, a, to a large extent, many sectors of the Indian industry are dependent on imports from China. Uh, as part of a, what we call as a globalization and the global supply chain, uh, this, this is inevitable. You, are, you, are, you can't be 100% self-sufficient in everything. Therefore, for strategic reasons, you may decide to say that I want to reduce my dependency on China. I'm just giving an example, say in the pharmaceutical sector, in terms of APIs and so on. But to make that change, it will. It, you can't do it overnight. You Capacity it So it will take three, five, seven years before you decide that some of the major APIs and formulations, etc., we start making them in India, find alternate sources and so on. And that is a strategic decision which both industry as the government have to do in partnership. Uh, can you, I just add? Yes, certainly, sir. Uh, uh, I, I totally go along with Mr. Uh, with Mr. Pillay. I thought a very sagacious analysis. But uh, may I just add, you have an opportunity today. If COVID was a great challenge, it also throws up great opportunity. The world has gotten a shock that it is over dependent on China. Exactly. And especially after Wuhan, a lot of you know Western and Japanese industries want to move out of there. There is your strategic opportunity. If you can provide them you know, space, rather than going to Vietnam and Bangladesh, if you can get them over to India, you would have been a great, great uh, gainer. And that is the government strategy. I hope that rectifies. We are able to get over our archaic labor laws and land laws and invite foreign investment and industry into India, especially make it relocate from China. You are on, you are on big back. So, just to... Uh... Close this point. If you see bullet number five on the slide, economic actions are being enhanced, and India has to an extent used the Wuhan virus episode to put on fast track a lot of what should have been done in the last 30 years. You can think of Chabahar port, you can think of South China Sea. Mr. Gopal Pillay spoke about the APIs. We are the pharma bosses, but 90% of the active pharmaceutical ingredient is imported from China. I will also talk of rare earth elements. In your periodic table, there are 17 elements which are hidden because they are not normally used. They are the key to the future of future technology, warfare, semiconductors, motherboards, fighter planes, telecom equipment. Who holds the monopoly? China. Where is the resource? Latin America, Australia, America, China. The good news is last month, some lithium has been found in Karnataka. But lithium is not part of the rare earth elements though. The point I'm making is capacity building is a process which cannot be expedited beyond a point. It is happening now. Let me give you the examples of the five DRDO labs which have just been set up exactly one year ago, 6th of January, 2020. These five labs are in quantum mechanics, artificial intelligence, asymmetric warfare, smart materials. The point is a lot of actions towards nation building are being accelerated. They will still have gestation periods of between three to five and in some cases seven years. Rare earth materials are important. Thank you. I'll just get back to the next question and we'll just have two more questions and then I'll have to seek permission from the respected speakers if we can continue. Yeah, thank you. We close after two questions. I think. Okay, sir. Thank you. Harish, Harish Prabhu has a question. How will the armed forces attract quality talent now and in the future to man it. 
especially due to the fact that a large part of the educated middle or upper class indians due to higher aspirations are wanting their children to go abroad to pursue greener pastures and other lucrative jobs the question is to brigadier or to general bakshi uh, sir general bakshi sir please thank you thank you sanjay it's a very live problem it is a very live problem we have seen the quality there is no dearth of intake but the quality of intake has shown a very very a dangerous decline very dangerous decline the best schools in my time they used to have the cadets coming to the nda they used to have their alumni coming to the nda you know now i'm sorry we really have to scratch the bottom of the barrel and sanjay has been the president of a services selection board so he would know best you see we had an ecosystem for motivation for combat for courage and that was the heart going to every village gajbar chhati prithvi raj ki aankhon bhaye mashal with that iktara of his poetry is now dead we thought bollywood and television would step in to motivate to create role models to create uh, ballads of bravery and heroism i'm afraid all we have gotten from bollywood is gangs of wasipur gunde don one don two don three now with this kind of an ecosystem how do you expect you know people good motivated young boys and girls to come to the armed forces in our time we used to read commando comics those are all finished there are no good war movies you can count them on your fingertip we need to change the ecosystem to attract good talent to attract the higher ability level united states suffered in vietnam when it was not able to get the people from harvard and massachusetts into the armed forces they paid a price let's not pay that price thank you sir last question of the session is from youtube mr anil bansal says india must create a nato style military alliance with australia and japan views so we have discussed this all three speakers feel that yes either the quad metamorphoses and gets military muscle else it be done by another grouping else it be done by bilateral groupings the aim being that the south china sea in particular and the indo pacific in general cannot be held ransom to the wayward ways of china as hitherto for final comments on this uh, general bakshi sir and then mr pillay to wind up for us sir you see we need to craft a new balance of power in asia and the two poles of power the only two which can balance the power of a rising and increasingly aggressive china is india and japan shinzo abe and prime minister modi made a very very major effort in this particular direction we have to see that it goes with or without the united states and we must factor in minor powers or lesser powers like vietnam like indonesia philippines malaysia they are all going to buy weapons from you and we need to factor in taiwan either we with or without the american we will have to create a balance of power in asia to balance the power of a rising and assertive china thank you sir mr pillay sir yeah i just uh, uh, like to just refocus back because partly my interest in uh, economics uh, the economy and uh, if you are a strong economy then you are also strong you can have money for the military and you can also make sure that your national power is uh, can be uh, displayed and used for national interest it's important for our economy to grow and therefore we have seen outside international institutions like you know the wto and so on and international trade they are not functioning at all to our, to our uh, uh, disadvantage what we need to do is to make sure that ease of doing business in india uh, even though the rankings have come down according to the world bank my personal feeling is shared by a lot of my friends in the industry is that really ease of doing business has not improved as much as it should do and if you can make that ease of doing business for people uh easy if you can make it simple 
And what people in the industry are looking for in one sense is consistency in policy. They want a policy, at least it can last for five years, 10 years, 15 years. Not that every, every year you keep changing policy, uh, then it becomes very difficult for industry to function. I think these are some of the few things uh, which government needs to focus upon so that industry, uh, while the atmosphere and the, you know, the entrepreneur spirit and, you know, the startup India and everybody is, is there, uh, these are the small things which are actually have people have the mental reservations, uh, should we invest or should we not invest? And I think that should be taken care of uh, by the government. Thank you, sir. And with that, I have to regret that there are more questions which have come in, but we have grossly, grossly overshooted the indulgence of our speakers, whom it remains for me to thank you both, sirs. It has been very enlightening, very vibrant and free flowing. And the audience also needs to be thanked because there was a virtual flow of questions and we have got a large and strong audience today. Good questions. Thank you all. And finally, a word for electronic payments and services for having organized this. They usually used to have it on special to their own domain. And when they interacted with me, I said, trust me, geopolitics, Indian national security, broad-based stuff will catch interest. And therefore, you can see Mr. Krishna Kumar smiling. Thank you, EPS, for giving an opportunity to your viewers to listen to great minds like Mr. Pillay and General Bakshi. Thank you all. It remains for me to wish you all a happy life ahead. Jai Hind from my side. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank and you. thank you to Vishwamu. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Goodbye, ladies and gentlemen. See you on, on Friday next. Yeah. Thank you, Vishnu. Thank you. Thank Goodbye. You. Jai Hind. Goodbye.